Dude, is that a Jay Alders piece right here? Uh, right there? <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> my, my little niece made me, my little niece, niece made me that. Oh, there you go. I gotta get. I still I have gotta, some pieces. Gotta though. send you some freshies. I know, dude. I love your art, man. I remember when I first came across it, like I don't know how many years ago now, but man, I had like three of your pieces up, I think. Well, you know what's crazy? I was uh looking through my Instagram. And uh, flipping back to when we first started messaging, and I think it was like almost 10 years ago, which is freaking bonkers. Pretty wild, dude. Yeah, man. All so, right, let's dive into it, bro. Yeah, dude, thank you for making this happen. Uh, sorry about the time uh, zone confusion on that. I should have checked in. I, no worries. Uh, yeah, I, I thought you were you were in San Diego before, right? Dude, no, everyone thinks I live in California, and I've always been kind of anchored in New Jersey. My family's all here. Really? Yeah. Always been East Coaster. I lived in Florida for a little bit, but always been an East Coaster. But everyone assumes I live in California. That's wild. I, sw I could have sworn you lived in Encinitas or something. That's wild. Maybe someday. We're both East Coasters, dude. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Savannah over there, right? Yeah. So I was I was thinking where to start this. I was like, I, I didn't have to do too much research because first of all, like I said, we've been chatting for like 10 years. I've been following you. But in during that time period, I, my daughter is now nine and a half. My twin boys are now eight. They are, wow. They're all competing at Skim USA contests. And quite really? often, quite often I wake up, go downstairs and they're up already watching your videos. So uh, they were like totally tripping out when I told them I was going to talk to you. Dude, that's epic, man. I actually made up a list of questions I have to ask you. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's funny. I think a good way to start this is just I was thinking as uh, as I was preparing, you know, it's it's funny. Like, we both have the most unlikely careers to succeed in. And yet, like, here we are. It's, like, insane. And I was, uh, you know, I've seen your videos. We've chatted. The world knows you through your videos and whatnot, but what I don't know a huge amount is like kind of where you like what little kid Austin was like. And I was wondering if you could kind of take me back, take us back to like the early days of you, what you were like as a kid. And I also really want to understand the mindset of like what it took for you, like wh what mindset were you in to, to pick up everything you had and just move across to the West Coast? Because that must have been either scary or just like crazy or I don't know what that felt like, but kind of walk us through that a little bit. Oh man, it's been like, the more I look back on it, like the crazier, like it seems, you know, like everything when you're a kid seems normal. And then right. you look back on your like, that was kind of weird. Um, yeah. But I actually, yeah, I mean, just to, I mean, I don't want to like ramble too much because I tend to ramble, but uh, yeah, I was born in Savannah, Georgia, lived there till I was about like two or three years old. And um we actually, my family relocated to like South Carolina for like a very short amount of time that I don't even barely remember at all. And then we moved to Indiana for like six years. So oh, I, lived, wow. I lived in the middle of nowhere in Indiana for six years and then moved back to Georgia um, uh, around like second grade or something like that. So I spent most of my time growing up in Georgia, but I do remember living in Indiana and um there's definitely some key uh, moments in my life there. Um, but when I moved back to Georgia, um, that's when I found, found like really the beach and, you know, saw like my first palm tree since I was, you know, one years old and I didn't really remember it. Mm -hmm. And I just love the beach, love palm trees ever since I was even grown up in Indiana and yeah, I, I went to the beach and that's when I found surfing and skimboarding. And uh, yeah, my, my parents were house parents in this massive, like, it's like an, it was like an old, like plantation style plot of land that's called uh, Bethesda Home for Boys. Mm -hmm. And it used to be an orphanage back in like the 1800s or like early 1900s and um, actually 1800s. And now it's like a kind of a, I guess, I don't know what the word is, but like a compound of like all these different like cottage houses and they have like a school on campus. It's like basically like a big giant, like private, like uh, college campus almost, but it's for like kids from like youth to, you know, get into high school. 
and uh, they have schools, church, cafeteria, like all the stuff you'd have in this little mini like town. And my parents, like half our house was our family and then half the house, you walk through a door, it's like a hostel style with like bunks and different rooms. And like, so like, it was weird because at the time I thought that was normal. And then like looking back, I'm like, that was kind of weird to grow up in, you know? Right. And even before that in Indiana, we had like my, my parents, we had like foster brothers and sisters, like they would foster kids, which is kind of an odd thing. But growing up in Georgia, yeah, just, um, I don't know if it was because I found the beach or what, but like, you know, I grew up very religious too. And like growing up in Georgia, it was just like very, I just felt like everything was so black and white, you know, and wasn't a lot of, there was actually zero narrative to, to pursue, say like a goal, like we have pursued, you know, like to pursue art as a career or being anything, any athlete other than like, say a professional football player, um, you know, there was no skate parks where I lived. I had to drive almost two hours away to go to the, to my first skate park, which I was just awestruck by because until then I was just watching X Games on TV and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I'd say like elementary school wasn't too bad, but like get into like later in elementary school, middle school was pretty rough. You know, I was like kind of going to some like pretty rough middle schools and at the time actually I was like a minority with being a little white kid with long hair so uh but it was also a lot of cool things too because you know I would hang out with the kids in the neighborhood and we'd just be, I'd be like only little white kid jumping around on a trampoline with these guys and like you know it was just it was that's when I learned how to start doing backflips like we just go to like like random little pieces of grass around the area and we go flipping we call it and we had no concept of like the fact that people did this you know like there was no like olympics in my head like oh yeah people do this for a living you know because mm -hmm. like if i knew that maybe I, <clears throat> that's what i would have pursued as being like a gymnast or something because i was so good at like doing backflips and so so were my friends at the time um but moving on in the middle school is kind of really or early like late elementary school is when i you know found uh, started skateboarding a little bit first, found action sports, and then went to the beach and like my brother's friend had a surfboard and I like hopped on that and I caught my first wave and I was just like, I was hooked at that point. Cause I love being at the beach already. And then like getting that feeling of catching a wave, it was un unbelievable. I think the wave was like knee high. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, okay. This is what I want to do. You yeah. Know? There's nothing like that. Were, were you like not, like a team sports guy. Like I was always more of an individual sports person myself. Is that, would you classify yourself in that way? Yeah. I mean, I think I am for sure. I, I, I became that. I don't know if I always was or what, but like I, I played soccer when I was like really young and then I ended up playing football uh, like in late uh, elementary school and middle school, but I just didn't like the last thing I wanted to do because school is pretty rough for me last thing I wanted to do was like spend more time at school you know like it was not like a happy place for me like the, I just wanted to go home eat a sandwich and go watch some x games or something like that you know mm -hmm. um, yeah the last thing I, and I remember when surfing really started kind of taking over my life like I had actually agreed with my best friend to sign up for soccer he's like we got to get our physical or whatever before next week you got you doing it right I'm like yeah yeah I'm gonna do it and I just never did it and I just remember like the waves being good that week. And I was kind of like made my decision. I was like, yeah, I'd rather go catch waves after school than, you know, go to soccer practice. But even though like catching waves for me at the time, I was still like 35, 40 minutes from the beach. I wasn't like close to the beach, but and yeah. so, like, it seems like at that point, like surfing was kind of like your thing. At what point, at what point did it kind of switch over to skim and was like, at what point did you really feel like, okay, I have something different than everyone else? Because every kid that lives near the beach is doing those kinds of things. But for somehow, somehow between that point and you like hopping in your, your BMW going across country, like something happened, something like clicked in your head. Like I actually have something other people don't have. How how did that happen? What were the first signs? Yeah. I don't really know if I ever had that, like, like feeling of like, I had something that maybe other people didn't have. I just think that, <clears throat> 
And I think I like, well, kind of backing up a little bit. Like I, I actually grew up doing surf contests. So like I got really into surf contests. We had like a little Georgia district of the ESA, hmm. um, Eastern Surfing Association. So like if you did well in that, you'd qualify to go to like the regionals and go to bigger contests. And so I remember there was a, there was a solid like three years that like my mom was taking me to all the surf contests and we go in all the Georgia district contests. And I made it to regionals a couple of times in North Carolina. So I was surfing against the best of my age in North Carolina. But um, even back then it wasn't like it is now, you know, like it wasn't like there weren't as many kids with the, the level of talent there are now. I mean, like whether it is music or sports or whatever, like it's insane now. But I just remember being really into surfing and then I started getting burnt out because I was like kind of like the odd one out. I'd go to these surf contests and like kids all knew each other and like I was just this kid from Georgia, you know, and like they could kind of like when there's never waves, there's barely ever waves in East Coast contests. It's rare, but I mean, sometimes it, there is, but especially in Outer Banks, but um, I just remember kind of getting really burnt out on it and getting over it and like kind of wondering like, why am I even competing anyway? Because I was very hard on myself. And um, I was like, why am I even doing this? And then around that same time, I uh, that's like when I found skimboarding. Because like growing up on Tybee and Savannah, the waves were not good. And so like found a skimboard and it was like something I could do to take advantage of just flat days, just still be at the beach running around. I was like an active kid. I wanted to still do stuff. And then uh, <clears throat> I ended up running into these two guys that were like they were like their mid-20s probably early 20s and then like they had like the fiberglass skin board and they were like hitting waves and I was just like damn I didn't even think about like sliding out and trying to hit waves on my skin board like that's crazy and then I'd already been surfing for quite a while at that point and taking advantage of all these little tiny waves close to shore so like they're the ones that kind of put me on to real skin boarding and then they showed me like they coincidentally, like I lived in the like middle of Savannah and they coincidentally lived down the street from me. And I found that out by skateboarding on the street one day. And I was like, no, like it was a total coincidence. And they showed me their first, the first, like my first VHS tape of like Laguna Beach skimboarding. And that was kind of the moment. Um, I think like things really shifted to skimboarding a lot for me. Like, it wasn't like a total shift. It was just like, whoa, I want to get, like, I just want to get as close to, as I can to doing what those guys are doing on that that video, mm -hmm. um, Laguna. So, like, we just started looking for waves, like, trying to figure out, like, oh, the waves are going to break closer at high tide, and these beaches are getting a little bit better for, like, catching waves. So, like, we just kind of, like, it was like a big paradigm shift for us of, like, how to find shore break waves. And then we, I went to my first skimboarding contest in Bolano Beach from, in 2015 um, and then saw how many people were like doing this high performance skimboarding, you know? Yeah. And it just, from that point on, uh, yeah, I just started like wanted, I was like, because I felt kind of limitless on a skimboard. And I remember the first time I actually caught a wave on a skimboard, like I was like, I just felt like I could do anything on it. Like there wasn't like anything about it that I was like, felt like I was being held back. Like, I just felt like, like even the surfing, like you feel like you're always trying to like, and especially surf growing up surfing Georgia. Like I felt like I was always held back. Like I always had like, I had two seconds on any giving wave to like try to make right. something out of it. It's just a short, such a short punchy wave if there's waves at all. And with skimming, I just felt like there was so much, I was kind of limitless of what I could try and get better at, even though the waves were small. And I think that's why I just started pursuing it. And I, I started doing some contests um, in Florida and within a year of like making that shift of really paying attention to skimboarding, I think I got really good really quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, fast forwarding to about 17 years old, that's when I was like, all right, my mom, my parents got divorced. And I was like, 15 or 16 years old and then I was just working on Tybee uh like seafood restaurants and stuff and then I visited California and while I was visiting California she's like I got a travel nurse job opportunity out in California would you want to go live out there and I was like 
hell yeah are you kidding me it didn't even seem yeah. real like this kid growing up in very conservative town like you know conservative family like i was just like that doesn't even seem real that i would ever go live in california and so i think she wanted to change she had the opportunity to go out there and uh she went out there and a few months later i just like i kind of kept my job and so i kind of lived on my own at 17 for like a few months and then packed up that old bmw that 75 bmw with uh my best friend at the time and we just drove it out that's unreal man yeah. i mean and then, and then it's like you, you fast forward a little bit you end up like winning a world championship you you're named i wrote down some notes here you're like got surfer today's most influential in wave sports next to kelly slater started taking up wake surfing excelled in that you end up on freaking ellen like unbelievable like list of, <laughs> a, a list of accomplishments i guess what i want to ask you based on kind of fast forwarding a bit to where closer to where you are now and also based on like where i've been with my career like there's been so many like amazing surreal moments but then you also have to come back to reality and i'm like i'm wondering at this point in your career austin do you feel like you've made it or do you feel still like wake up and think like you have to prove something to yourself like where are you at mentally and like where's your ego at with all this now oh man i feel like i'm like constantly always grinding you know i don't <clears throat> i feel like i i definitely achieved a goal that i wanted in the past which is just to simply make a living doing like through skimboarding and in action sports and doing what i love um but now as i've gotten there i think that my aspirations have always in the back of my head even been larger than what can be provided from action sports so which is why now i've kind of like um been really focusing a lot of my energy into like kind of growing businesses and being a part of businesses mm -hmm. um even a couple of my sponsors that i have like some equity in that like helping them grow and build um so i feel like that's where a lot of my focus is now i mean there was i mean there's just been so many different like chapters of my life, you know, like when I first moved out here, it was like the chapter was just like skim, 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 you know, and then like some surfing in between, you know, I graduated high school at Venice Beach in LA, moved out here right before my last year of high school. And it was just all about going, driving down to Laguna as much as I could, or, you know, skimboarding locally up there in Malibu or surfing up in Malibu. Um, so I was just like, it was all about just catching waves, like perfecting my craft, getting as good as I possibly could. And then I think I just like started getting really good, really fast because I spent, I was kind of so obsessed with it. You know, there's like nothing else that was in my head that I could, I mean, looking back now, like compared to all the shit that's floating around in my head now, compared to like what I was like focused on back then, it was just like, doing what I had to do, which is like school or like making some money and then like skim, you know, just like pretty, pretty plain cut. Like I'll, I would just go drive, make that drive in that old car from LA to Orange County, just like three times a week, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, I was super obsessed with it. And then eventually, you know, started competing on, in the, in the, like one, one, every contest I could win in my age group went pro. And then, um, you know, a few years later started actually winning pro contests and getting better and better and just staying obsessed with the sport. And yeah, you know, working odd jobs to support that career. You know, I was like doing plumbing in Laguna Beach. I started a mobile bartending company with um, my girlfriend, you know, like anything I could to kind of keep things going. And then eventually was, I think the year I won the world well, the year I won the world title, like was competing on the tour of eight contests around the world. I was working um, just at a restaurant, just serving and bartending. And that, that was kind of the best job for me because it was so flexible, you know, working at night. I could spend the whole day at the beach, any part of the day, depending yeah. on the waves and tide. So I think I was just staying obsessed with getting as good as I as good as I could. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode with Austin. Just taking a very quick break. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Don't worry. I have a quick ask. So my kids are giant fans of Austin. And at the end of the episode, they make a little cameo. And my, my sons do a little commercial for their YouTube channel. It would mean the world to me 
if you guys can subscribe to their YouTube channel and just stick around for that. They're, uh, they were just having so much fun being able to talk to Austin. And uh, just as a dad, I just wanted to put that out there so you don't miss it. One more quick thing. In case you haven't um, figured it out from the episode, I'm an artist. If you don't know my work, I would encourage you to go to jayalders.com. J-A-Y-A-L-D-E-R-S. I have posters and prints and original art and apparel and merchandise and all kinds of cool stuff. Your support means everything to me. And if you're not into making a purchase today, if you could just check it out, connect with me on socials, that means a lot to me also. Um, So yeah, enjoy the rest of the episode. I want to ask you this because I I personally have this theory that business people and people that like air quotes like succeed in life, I think people that start out with like action sports backgrounds have a a hedge have a little bit of an edge on other people because if you're getting into skateboarding you're getting into skimming you're getting into surfing or any of these types of activities in order to achieve any level of success in order to get anywhere in those sports you have to be very willing to fail over and over and over again and look like a complete jackass in front of everyone that's watching. If you're surfing, everyone sees you. If you're at the skate park, everyone sees you. And I personally feel like that mindset shifts you by, by experiencing those very public failures. And I'm I'm hearing you tell your story and it's like, you didn't care about having to work and doing plumbing. You didn't care about having to start over. You just were like laser focused and like whoever saw you, didn't matter i'm wondering do you think like your background in these types of activities this this acceptance and embracing of failure has sort of shifted you as a business person and in your life as you bring up a lot of interesting points there a lot of good perspectives like i never really thought about it that way um but yeah i think that's great for uh like action sports it's great like i never even thought about how like you're putting yourself out there on a public stage to fail like whether you're you know just starting out or you're professional you know like it's like such a solo sport i've always thought of of it being a little bit of like a difficult path just because such an individual sport like you don't have a team to rely on as far as the competing side but i never really thought about you know how it like helps you accept accept failure and failure publicly but also brings you in a community too. It like lets you, it kind of brings you into like an, a stage where other people are failing too, and they're okay with it. You know, it's like a, you know, you go to a skate park, no one's like, you see somebody fall, and you're not laughing at somebody falling. Mm-hmm. You know, not at all. Like you just look past it. You don't even think twice about it. So it's like, or you cheer them on, or or you're like rooting them on because like, oh, you you did it anyway. You know, like you fell. Yeah, for yeah. It. Or you're like you're oh. almost there. You almost got it. You know, like right. I never really thought about how how good that could be for like kids. That's pretty cool. How do you approach your your view of business and how do you what's your mindset around like building your brand? Because you said like a lot of your focus has kind of shifted towards that. And I'm asking this both as someone that's a business person myself, but also kids listening. I think a lot of especially my kids, they'll see someone like you and like, I want to do that. And I'm like, of course you want to do that. But it's like, I also think in the back of my head, you don't understand what it takes to be doing what he's doing, like the video editing and the building relationships and like the branding and the marketing and all the other stuff that's involved with it. I'm wondering how you approach business. And also uh, I'm asking, or I would like to ask, are there certain business leaders or certain books that just kind of like, boom, like sparked within you that changed how you think about all this? Um, another great question. Um, I think honestly, man, I wish I could have, I had like these crazy, like, you know, cool quotes to give people, you know, like I see all these business mentors, but like, I feel one thing I realized I'm very, uh, ADD and I'm very unorganized and I try my hardest. I think it's just like having what, having ambition and drive to really just want to absorb and learn and navigate you know it's just like i'm constantly just like feel like i'm navigating through this like crazy you know wavy stormy sea and i'm just like all i know is i'm i'm gonna drive the boat and i'm gonna get better at it you know so um i'm definitely not you know a pro businessman by any chance but i think i just have a lot of ambition a lot of drive to just kind of keep going and you know i learn as much as i can to uh you know, navigate the waters of any type of business. And I think I've, I feel like I've learned a lot. And I think that's what it is, just being willing to absorb information and implement it, you know, 
And I think that's kind of what I've been doing now. And I'm still just learning so much along the way. I mean, of all the different, like I got a cold plunge studio now, like that was probably, you know, I couldn't help but take up the opportunity to kind of fulfill one of those, you know, dreams I had of having that studio. But now I'm like, man, I could have done without that stress, you know, <laughs> but yeah. it's like a really cool place that's providing something that people love and appreciate in the community. And I'm, I mean, I had no prior knowledge of how to start a brick and mortar business, you know, and there's like so many things about it now that I, that I would know or be able to tell somebody getting into it. Um, the same that goes for a lot of different stuff, you know, selling products, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, there's, I think I've had a lot of mentors in my life. Uh, you know, my, my dad, it wasn't really super present growing up, um, just cause he was overseas, like most of my entire life, you know, he went over to Afghanistan, Iraq during that war, and then basically just stayed overseas living in Asia since then. I actually just saw him like a few weeks ago for the first time, in, like 13 years. But I think because of that, I've always seeked out like advice from um older six more successful people than me and you know i always see the best in somebody i feel like it could be a good thing and a bad thing but i've always kind of like looked to these older mentors and like try to absorb as much as i can and then you know obviously it's just like such a different world we live in now with like constant information being thrown at you on tiktok and instagram of like business advice and kind of rules to live by it's just like there's so much you know so i think just trying to ultimately just trying to be ambitious driven and i think one thing that's made me successful too is to never be complacent like the further i've gotten i've just i the the, the further ahead i get the the further I want to stay away from where I was, you know what I mean? Cause I was like, I mean, just went from zero, like complete zero, like bare minimum. And as I've grown, like, I just don't ever want to go backwards to where I have to work a plumbing job or have to go bartend or serve or anything like that. Like I can't imagine, you know, doing something that wasn't, pushing towards a path that I love to do. I mean, and right now I've been business is kind of that, like I've been like really stoked on trying to build business and be successful in business. I feel like, you know, that's kind of one of the things that like we have like this subconscious bucket list in our head. And I think I'm kind of on that path where it's like my next thing on my, like my checklist is to build some type of brand or business and, you know, make a lot of money from it. I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit, Austin, because you just started this out by saying, I don't have much to say. Not only did you have things to say, but you had a lot of valuable lessons in there that I don't even think you you are viewing what you're saying from an outside perspective. Like you just kind of told me a lot of things that I think have a lot to do with success. And like you mentioned, you know, running from something. I think a lot of people, a lot of kids, especially like that have a dream, like you have something you want to run towards, but like what you just said about the plumbing like, I think you equally need something to run from. And yeah. I've had that with my career too. Like it's almost more motivating if you're running from something than running to something. Cause running so, to something is like so easy to see. I want that car and that girl and this career and whatever, whatever. But if you don't have something you're running from, you're not going to have like the discipline. And I was thinking as you were describing it, like you, you seem to have like a very intuitive approach with things, which makes total sense on the same way. And like the way that I approach my career, I think, is the same what you're doing. It's like people will watch these like TikTok videos, like how to paint an eyeball in five seconds or whatever, right? And people want like the instant like theory or like you said to start this, you said the, the business quotes, but a, a lot of it is just very intuitive on how it feels. And I think like you being a rider of boards on water in multiple aspects of that and me being very amateur at, you know, I'm a sucky surfer, although I love it. I'm sucky at skimboarding, skimboarding, but I love it. I love skateboarding. I love all that too. And I think a lot of that has to do with making micro decisions in the moment. Like you're riding on a wave, you see something, not, not consciously, just subconsciously, there's something there and you just immediately, boom, go for it. And I feel like that's where 
the phase you're at right now with business is like you're riding this business wave. You see an opportunity, boom, trying it. Sometimes you'll fall, sometimes you'll mess up, but I, I feel like that's where you're at. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, man. I think you're, yeah, you do a really good job at uh, verbalizing all that stuff. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say I would agree with that. I'd say like my entire, the entire journey has been pretty intuitive, really. You know, I mean, even from the point of like deciding to make a like turn being a world champion title and a little tiny niche sport like skimboarding um, into a career, I had to kind of navigate on my own you know, okay, how do I get sponsors? How much do I charge? Like, what are my deliverables? Or like, how do I, how do I figure out how to grow that sponsorship, like, fund? How do I do, you know, like all this stuff? So like, and how do I keep kind of growing and stacking on top of that? So like, I was constantly just like, there was no playbook for that, because it hadn't been done in my sport, at least. And um, it was probably pretty uncommon altogether to have to do that on your own with most action sports um, that weren't, you know, it's not televised, it's not on X games. It gets, you know, no public uh, spotlight really. So there's not a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot that you have to do on your own. So I think I was just kind of intuitively like, okay, well, I'm going to ask for this much from this sponsor, you know, or like I got to figure out and then trying to like take everything I've taken from like, you know, different business people or different businesses absorb from that and trying to apply it to my business. And yeah, now I'm just doing that same thing right now with like uh, hoping to build a big brand. Like we got like the one thing I'm working really hard on is our vitamin bar brand. It's our plant-based protein bar. We actually sponsored one of the Skim USA contests last year. Um, so it's like we got the plant-based protein bar helping Rusty navigate their wake surfing line. And then got the cold plunge studio, just a lot of stuff. We got those. Are, are you plant based, Austin? What's that? Are you plant based personally? I'm not right now. No, no. But our, our bars are because we want to make sure that we can include everybody. I, huh. I, I don't really like um, like any whey protein powders. It doesn't really agree with me, like on my stomach and stuff. So, um, yeah, just like whenever I do like protein shakes or bars it's like plant-based is just is way more digestible for me and also it's kind of inclusive to everybody and that's kind of what we wanted to make is a a bar that's not going to like that's going to be just like the ultimate bar for everybody you know yeah i want to ask one more one more question on business and then we'll get to some more fun stuff are you plant-based i am actually yeah my whole family is nice what yeah. was the what was the uh deciding factor for that um, I don't want to bore everyone. So I'll tell you a quick version of it. When I was um, like maybe 15 or so, I had this cousin in Brooklyn, Michelle, they used to come down and like bring her guitar. And she was like the, just like the stereotypical hippie girl, long hair, she'd walk in with her guitar and her beads. And I thought she was the coolest thing ever. And she'd play guitar and we'd just hang out and chat. And she was vegetarian. And I, st I was just, you know, just hanging out bullshit. And then I, I would ask her like, why do you do that? Blah, blah, blah. And she kind of told me her reasons were more like moral based. And she started questioning me on things and never pushed anything. She just said, oh, you know, asked me about how I felt about animals because I always said I, I loved dogs and cats and I loved animals. And she started questioning and she'd leave and I'd think and then she'd ask me questions and I'd think about it. And then after a little bit of pondering, I realized that my moral compass was set that I, I loved animals and I couldn't I couldn't really decipher like why would I love my dog? But I didn't love this like pig or this totally. cow. It didn't make it didn't process. To I me. think about this all the time. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I started feeling like a hypocrite. It didn't feel right. And like for me, not everyone, but for me, if I feel hypocritical, it's like probably one of the worst feelings that I personally can have. Like I yeah. hate feeling like a hypocrite. I, I like feeling like, and I don't always succeed at it, but I like feeling like my moral compass is pointed towards my true north, whatever that is. And so I just realized like overnight, really, I was like, okay, this doesn't align with my beliefs. And I just started, I, so I started uh, eating vegetarian at 16 and then it wasn't until 2008 that uh, my now wife and I became vegan. So that's the oh, question. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, man, I have a lot of respect for it because especially on the moral side, I mean, like not so much when people try to argue like the nutrition side, because I feel like there's so many like debatable con contradicting sciences. Yeah, and totally. It's just like a never ending rabbit hole. But like 
one thing I can agree on is like I love animals too, and I don't ever want to see animals be like tortured or like pinned up or anything like that. I mean, like even me and my fiance, we try our best to just you know buy the best quality like free range beef or free range chicken. Like we really try to pay attention to that because we love animals. Um, but yeah, all the time I'm kind of like uh like i actually don't even eat like i cut out i was like all right i gotta cut out one so i pretty like for the most part i don't eat pork at all like okay. so i was like because i saw a pig in nicaragua i was like that pig is too cute yeah they are really, really cute. not the cleanest <laughs> animal either even though it's not a cleanest i was like it's too cute i'm I'm over it like people have pet pigs now and stuff and i was like all right i'm gonna cut that one out that's, e that's easy for me because they really don't have like a lot of nutritional value like as far as like eating bacon and stuff it's just like um but um yeah sometimes i have that moment like the, just like literally like two nights ago i was eating like you know homemade chicken taco and i was just like i just had these moments where i'm like so weird that like i'm literally eating like the flesh of this animal you know? <laughs> right you're like eating a <laughs> dead animal corpse <laughs> but i am and it's very nutritious as far as i know i mean it's freaking packed with protein and omegas and all that stuff but yeah i don't ever but the moral side of it i i totally get it's it's a it's a weird thing but then sometimes you also think like like on the other side you can always have arguments you're like well like a, a vegetarian diet like when you're like the farms are you know you know farming and harvesting plants and like they're killing thousands of little gophers and mice and stuff like that to do this harvesting because they're just dragging That's big cool. giant trackers so it's, it's like animals to like to really supply humans to harvest like plants like you have to still sacrifice animals for that and then also like if you think about like if you ever watch like these instagrams like nature is metal like animals in the wild just have to die horrible slow deaths you know like they're getting like their insides eaten out before they're even dead you know so at least like at least like a lot of times you know I just don't like when the living is in captivity. I think that's horrible. Like, like there's I, like for me, I don't see anything wrong with like hunting an animal. Like, yeah, it, it's it's lights out before it even it probably it, at most maybe it it has to bleed out for like forty five seconds. But like, that's better than it getting mauled to death by a coyote or you know a bear or you know whatever whatever predator animal is going to eat it. But it's a weird thing. Humans are weird, huh? Well, you know what? I'm like, I'm the type of vegan that I don't tell, like, if, unless you ask me about it, you would most likely never know unless we went out to dinner. I'm not pushy with everyone. I'm like almost all my friends and family eat meat. I've, I have friends that are hunters. I've had many conversations about it. I'm very open-minded to like how other people live. I have very strong moral beliefs, but I don't push it on people. But for me, it came to the moment where I, I think that uh, if you're, if you're hunting, I think you're, you're more connected to what's going on. There's no ignorance. There's no like blind eye to it. You're not like having someone else do for it. For sure. And yeah, I think me, that blind eye thing is kind of weird, huh? Like, yeah, like for me, I, I know I couldn't personally, I personally couldn't do it. So it's like, if I couldn't personally do it, who am I to like pay whoever to go ahead and keep these animals locked up? Well, and, you know, there's different people for different roles. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you personally wouldn't want to do either. Like, you know, that somebody sees no problem with, like cleaning airport toilets, you know, like some for somebody who's like, no way I could ever do that. Or like be a housekeeper at a hotel. Mm -hmm. You know, I think some people are just like, Cause I've thought that same thing. I'm like, if I didn't want to do it, then why should I, like, why should I be consuming it? But then I was like, also thinking there's a lot of stuff that I <clears throat> could never, you know, do. I mean, you could, like, if you could for sure, hundred percent kill an animal and eat that thing, if you're about to starve or, you know, had to put yourself in that situation, but yes. you just don't want to do that. <clears throat> Some people have no problem doing it, but I think that goes with a lot of different, you know, jobs or tasks. Yeah, dude. I mean, look, I I own guns, and like, if someone fucked with my family, they they'd not like it very much. And so, mm -hmm. and same thing. If there was like some kind of apocalyptic war, I'd be out there hunting next to you. But the fact of the matter is, like, I feel like in our current society, the way I the way we are now, who knows what happens in the future? But like, I feel like my personal motto in life generally is like, do as little harm as possible. That's sort of my my goal. Yeah. But um. No, I I like I said, I I totally respect it, dude. I don't have anything. I mean, like too many argue like just like just the points i brought up it's just stuff that like i'm super open-minded to do it and like totally i feel like i'm like that guy that could like easily go like vegetarian or something or vegan if, if like someone's like hey here eat 
eat these things right here and you're going to get the same amount of everything, you know, because I feel like as an athlete, like in a, in a person who's so health conscious, like, and who already, <clears throat> I already struggle with having every option in the world, like having, you know, like choosing what I want to eat and having the right stuff to eat. So, I mean, I wish there was a magic button I could just push and just be like, oh, you don't have to eat anymore. You know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to get everything you need. So I think that's like, yeah, I, I totally, on the moral side of it, I totally agree. I but sorry, of, uh, you know, wrap us, bring us down that conversation. Oh, no, that's cool. I'm open an interesting to it, you know. topic. Yeah, it's, Unexpected tangent. I'm, I'm down. That's, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I do the same thing like in the morning. I, I don't like to think about it either. I have this like giant blender that I fill with like all healthy stuff. And I just like my family just is used to it at this point, but I walk around the house with like a full blender of like amazingness that I just, next couple hours you egg? oh you're vegan so you don't yeah, do yeah. eggs either yeah no so what's the reason behind that just because it's, it's like the egg of, thing yeah i'll answer but i don't want to go on a tangent where we lose all of our audience <laughs> i don't want, I don't want to <laughs> yeah. but uh really like, real quickly with eggs um it's just a it's it's that's less of a moral thing with me but the way eggs are produced on a mass scale is the chickens are generally kept yeah, yeah, in activity totally. and they grow them from like the time they're born or hatched until about they rush their they they rush their growth process to about six weeks. But what about like normal like you can get like like really it's like pretty easy like farmers markets have yeah like, totally yeah. I don't think that's that's not nearly as strong of a conviction for me like I think I think for me I don't do it just because I'm still on the fence of whether knowing whether eggs are healthy or not I'm not really sure there's so much mixed huh. science of it eggs are not so much of an as major of an issue for me if you're eating them farm raised you know but again like to each their own i'm not judging anyone like do your do your thing you know all right yeah yeah anyways we'll get off the <laughs> no it's all we'll talk another time about it we'll uh gonna turn into uh, a seven and a half hour joe rogan podcast here. <laughs> right <laughs> which i'd be fine with but you tell me you got to get off so we'll uh i want to i don't want to miss anything um so i know you got into like wake surfing at, at some point i'd love to hear how that journey happened or how that <laughs> happened but what i'm what i'm super curious about because i've only done wake surfing a little bit on my father-in-law's boat it's super fun but i'm wondering like what are the main differences or challenges like between the two sports for you is there a difference in like uh between mindset or like technique for you and, and someone that's maybe not done it yet how might the transition look for them for somebody who's never wake surfed ever well like for you like i guess um i guess technically speaking we'll go from like is is turning different is the board different is your mindset different on how you approach it is there, or is it like really just another is it like me painting with acrylic and oil it's kind of the same but not really oh yeah that's interesting like if you're an already an action sports athlete maybe or something or a surfer yeah, already, yeah i mean I, it's probably just like that you know it's like painting with a different medium you know you're it's it's a wave but yet it's definitely a different type of wave it's like a displacement mm -hmm. wave that you're constantly moving at a different speed. And rather than this mass of water pushing you like in the ocean, it's more of a, of a kind of a displacement wave that you're kind of just stuck in the same spot. And you're, it's almost a little bit more like a treadmill effect where you're like a river wave, you know, where you're kind of, it's more of the, the flow of water that's keeping you in that pocket rather than it being but what's weird about a wake <clears throat> is it's it's a displacement wave like it's it's like a river wave but it's a it is a wave being caused by the displacement of the boat so it actually is moving as well but without that movement of the boat there's not there's no longer that much energy in the wave so that wave will eventually just fall and then dissipate mm -hmm. so it's kind of it's a really interesting type of wave but it's definitely different than an ocean wave but yeah. You can, as somebody who can ride a board, you can figure it out very quickly. I mean, I always say that, like, you know, wake surfing is the easiest, most forgiving, risk-free action sport. It's like, it's hard to call it an action sport, like, when you're getting into it, because it's just so, like, risk-free, uh, consequence-free. It's so easy to learn. Like, I've taught so many people, and like, to stand up on a board in just, like, 15 minutes. You know, it's like there's no other, and then like here you are giving a person who's never surfed in their life the longest ride that any surfer will ever get in their life. You totally. Know? You know, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. Like that's the thing that trips me out. I'm like, okay, this person just rode away for three minutes straight. Like you could surf your entire life and never get a three minute ride. You know, so true. <laughs> it's, 
but it's like that's the cool thing about wake surfing though is it it can really help you know people kind of get that balance take their time you have somebody in the back of the boat telling them exactly like where to put their feet you know and how to balance so it's like i figured out <clears throat> exact like like watching uh this guy who used to take me out in San Diego when I first got into it, Marco Thompson, he taught, he's taught like over a thousand people on a wake surf. So I would just like really listen to him, how he's teaching people and really just simplify it. He like, just tell them where to put their, like put his head in the visual of where their feet need to go. Like a lot of times as like action sports athletes, like we want to go that intuitive route where it's like, just bring your body this way. So you can kind of like, you know, kind of like, Put your weight over this side but like instead of doing that like people who don't really understand that language he's just yeah. like slide your toes that way right and then like turn your chest this way you know it's so like, like literally telling people how to move their bodies so like Man. i was i kind of really took a lot of tips from marco thompson and how to teach the people myself and um yeah just being very like systematic about we're telling them what to do and it works it's pretty wild if you just if you have somebody who truly wants to like try to do it because there's some people who are like they're like yeah i want to learn our way surf and then they're like not listening to you or they they don't you can tell they just don't really believe that they could do it or they don't really want to do it but most of the time if somebody's back there like they're like yeah i want to do this like i want to learn how like i want to figure this out so if you have just like a little ounce of drive to try to learn how to wake surf it's the easiest thing Austin, I, I want to know, once you build a level of fluency with a skimboard, let's say, I want to understand what it is that makes you perform on it differently than someone else. Because skimboarding is fairly simple, we'll say, right, For as compared to, let's say, skateboarding, which is super technical. There's only like a finite-ish amount of moves to do. But for some reason and somehow you make the board go faster, farther, you're more creative with it. And I don't want you to answer me in a way, like you said before, well, I put my toes this way. And I, I want you to like, <laughs> I want you to like, as you're answering this, because I love talking about art from that perspective. Like when I'm in this, I'm going to preface it by saying this, like when I am in the zone, when I'm painting, which is not always, sometimes I'm going through the motions. Sometimes I have like tricks up my sleeve that I've done a thousand times. Sometimes I'm using color theory, but when I get in that zone, it feels like I'm picking up like light come shooting out of my palette. And it, it's like, as I'm painting, it feels like I could not make a mistake if I tried because it's so yeah. obvious. It's so obvious the right move to make. And I know there's a version of that for you. And I want you to put yourself in that mindset and tell me what that feels like for you and how that might make you perform better or more creatively than someone next to you with a similar amount of skills well i would like to get more info later after this about how you feel get that light in the end of your paint stroke because that sounds epic <laughs> like where you just cannot mess up and i want to know what you ate that day <laughs> we'll talk drank. about it <laughs> <laughs> um because with skimboarding i don't know i just feel like you know, I've always had to drive just to ever since, you know, watching those videos of like all the guys who I'm still skimboarding with today, you know, that are older than me now. But um, just watching those videos back then of what they were doing, it just always drove me to kind of do that and and more. And I think I just like felt limitless on a skimboard. And the more the frustrating thing about skimboarding, it's not like a skate park where you can just show up and hit the same ramp every every day all day the frustrating about skimboarding is like you're just you're completely reliant on these changing elements that might might not be exactly how you want them you know so i think that's the most frustrating thing about the sport where it's like you can just never get you know a perfectly smooth canvas to work with you know like the perfect skimboard wave to come in it's like you're constantly looking for it and every now and then you get those days where like oh this is so nice you know like the waves are coming in perfectly the timing's right i'm sliding out super far because of the timing of the water and like the waves are just lining up right for skimboarding and it just doesn't happen super often and <clears throat> back when i was like really trying to like just excel my skimboarding and compete on the 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 skim tour and stuff like that i mean i didn't care like i like if the conditions were bad i was out there just telling myself well you got to figure out how to be the best in this in these conditions so um 
now I'm a lot more picky. Like now I show up at the beach, I'm like, I already know what I can do on this, like on these waves. You know, I think like, I think like that also comes with where I am in my life too. Like I think um, having my brain in so many different places has kind of given me a little creative burnout, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think like I haven't been super creative in my art as far as like skimboarding or anything whether it be because i'm just so focused on so many different things so i think that's something i'm going through now but um yeah i mean i i don't know like what that what was the the original question i just kind of like want to know like what that kind of zone feels like for you like almost like an if you can sort of like um almost like describe what's going through your head and it doesn't have to be in like a uh a narrative sense like at first i did this and then i did that but i'm kind of wanting yeah. to know like, maybe a moment well, i mean you... like i said it's it, you don't always get those times where everything is perfect but yeah. like if the waves are good and i'm feeling and i'm feeling good you know like i'm feeling good about like how my balance everything on the board like yeah i mean i feel like there's those times where you just feel really locked in i mean those those times feel great you know i think it's it's not common that feeling super locked in on your skimboard, but then also, you know, the waves being perfect. Like those two per those two things kind of coming into, like, you know, together like don't happen very often. But when they do, it's an amazing feeling for sure. Uh, I just wish you know, like, that's the thing about skimming is like the the better you get, and when you get it like my level and like say the level of a lot of pro riders, like. I just feel like uh, you require a little bit more. I mean, there's still guys who are at very high pro level that are like still hungry to like do as much as they want that like, can like on small, you know, shitty waves. But yeah, I think for me, it's always been about riding a really good wave. So like the, the more, the better I get and the more I know how to, you know, navigate a wave on a skimboard, the more I'm just like more hungry just to like get more wave time. And I think that's what skimboarding has always been about to me is like taking like what should be impossible, like, and getting the most out of that. Like skimming is like when you're literally running on the sand, running from the land, like connecting the land and then now being on a wave, which should be technically impossible to do. You know, like surfing is all you're in the water, you're catching the wave. That makes sense. But it doesn't really make sense to like, catch a wave when you're when you were just standing on the beach like a minute ago you know yeah. so i think like for me it's always been about like how can i catch wave like a wave on a skimboard how can i like maximize what i can get out of this wave on a skimboard and i think that's also why i like got a little burnout on skim contest too is because like we're not a big giant organization but like wsl where we can like say all right we're going to be at this location for two weeks and we're guaranteed Cause this is the best two weeks of the year here. Usually we're going to get good waves for skimboarding, you know? So like you can't ever showcase, like you can't really showcase like maximum talent now on skimboarding, like necessarily on a pro level. You can to some extent, like on, in a certain area, like te technicality and technical tricks and stuff. But like for me, skimboarding has always been about when I was a kid watching those videos and like getting barreled in these like, shore breakways right near near the beach and like doing big turns into a barrel like really riding the wave ultimately you know and that's kind of what it is to me now so now i i kind of really look for those days where i can really do that i mean i have days too where i'm like oh it's small and it's fun like you know i'm kind of in the mood to kind of see if i can throw that or throw this you know but yeah i think right now i just i think i just need a lot i need some wave riding in my life right now yeah. Whether it be on a surfboard or a skimboard or a foil, you know, like that's kind of where I'm at, where I'm just like, I just want to ride, you know? I think you're like at a, a pretty cool level of like fame where you have like enough followers to like have a lot of the great benefits of people knowing who you are, who you are and probably just just below that where it's like you're not being bombarded by paparazzi or crazy people. right? As <laughs> yeah, I think I'm way below that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you, you know, you're very recognizable with the cool hair and all that. Yeah, yeah. What I'm wondering is like, you know, I, I know you've done some cool things with like certain celebrities or well-known people on your on your channels and whatnot. Which opportunities like kind of pop out to you that would like when you put your head, head on the pillow at night, you're like, 
did that really just freaking happen? Like, are there moments still or in the past ones that pop out to you? Like, wow, that was a really sick opportunity. I can't believe that just happened. Uh, what what um, popped in your off head? the top of my head? I mean, like, there's been experiences that have nothing to do with my sport that I've been able to experience. I'm just like, that's crazy. Like, I, I feel like sometimes I get numb to like these crazy experiences because like I've had such a full life of just not everything has been glamorous and awesome, but it's just like a full life of just different experiences and different places, different faces, you know? And I think you just start to expect different things to happen, but yeah, there's like certain experiences that were like that. That's insane. You know, or like, give me some, man. You're like, you're teasing us here, bro. Oh yeah. Like, so like there was one time that I was like, I had a friend invite me on his uh, sailboat in Turks and Caicos and we were on a sailboat for 10 days. And, um, yeah, we were like just following whales out there in Turks and Caicos. And I was already in love with Turks and Caicos after being out there probably four or five times. And I got to see it from a whole new perspective, going down to different islands, being on the water for 10 days straight and swimming with wet like whales. And we're just, we're not on like a charter or anything. We're just like out there looking for them with drones. And it was just kind of wild. And then did like a couple psychedelics for the first time in my life so i was like just like that kind of like made it even more like you know intense and just like it was pretty cool it's amazing like i look back on that i'm like whoa um and then there's like times too you meet certain people you're like damn like that's pretty freaking cool like i got to do like i have like right above my um computer here on the wall i have a signed Tony Hawk board right so like we took Tony Hawk wake surfing and then the day before I was like just scouring skate shops trying to find like a birdhouse board you know like a like a legit but with the hawk you know yeah. and um finally found one like you know like right before all skate shops were closing I was so thankful I found this super sick uh Tony Hawk birdhouse board that he could sign and I was just like blown away that I was able to like take him wake surfing on my boat like he's asking me how to do a 360 on the wave and then like Alone, right also i'm finagling you know like in some way i'm bringing some sort of value in this weird world to where like he's allowing me to come to his warehouse and skate his half pipe and then drop in for the first time on his half pipe like not for the first drop in on vert for the first time on his half pipe it was just like when you kind of think about that you're like how the hell did i even get here <laughs> little that little kid for, in, like in georgia yeah. you know that was like getting off the school bus putting like plywood on a tire and just like imagining being on like a in a skate park one day and like i'm just like hitting this little piece of wood on a tire like after a shitty day in middle school and i'm just like never in a million years would i have ever been like oh dude one day you're gonna have tony hawk on your boat and then he's going to take you to his office headquarters and you're going to drop in on his bird ramp you know <laughs> like that's i guess like kind of like thinking like that that's pretty freaking wild and i think like honestly i like almost like all the things i have like trophies in my um i have all these like you know trophies like the youtube plaque i got the gopro million dollar challenge thing you know like next to like say the world championships the skimboarding trophy i'd say like just when I look at that Tony Hawk board, I'm just like, that thing puts like, it puts like life and perspective for me a lot. So like, I think that, that probably answers your question the best out of, out of anything more than that Turks and Caicos experience. Cause you know, Turks and Caicos, I can have anybody, but like, just like this has such a deeper meaning to the process of like where I was and like where I am now, but that, that skate deck that's, says thanks austin tony hawk <laughs> i love that because it, it kind of i love that because it kind of ties in both like bookmarks of your life like now and then and i like i like that that kind of like encapsulates both of those totally and then skateboarding is where it started for me you know like i didn't i was me on too. a skateboard before i was on a surfboard Same. You know? so that's kind of what introduced me to active sports and <clears throat> yeah and, I, and i'll always you know i always have skate in me i just don't skate as much now because i feel like it it's just a little bit high risk for all the water sports that i'm doing you know it's like if i hurt myself doing one thing now i'm now eliminated five things that i like to do yeah 
I mean, I'm not saying those other uh, things can't end in here, but I just feel like skating for me is a little higher risk just because I don't really have a lot of chill. You know, like as soon as I get more confident, I'm just like, okay, a little more. Let me do a little more, a little yeah. more, you know, until I'm just like pushing it. And yeah, I just like I skated the other day uh, for the first time in like forever, but I just like to st still know that I got it, you know, and just totally, yeah. Because I I don't require much on a skateboard, but the better I get, I am like, that's the thing about skateboarding action sports. When you do something, you're just like, well, I, I'm, I know I can do this. So I know I could go a little further, you know, why not try that? You know, <laughs> I'll tell you what's, what's amazing now. Cause I, I love, I've always loved skating too. What's amazing now is watching my little kids, watching my little kids skate is amazing. Like my, uh, Oh, dude! My little bad. guys, I take them to the skate park. They they drop in. They're like learning rock to fakies now. Like I'm trying to like push them a little bit, and it's just amazing to uh to see. Yeah, that. like what you said too, the failure thing. Like I've always said that like every kid should should like it should be like required, like a required class. That you know we have like these stupid required classes in like school grade school that like maybe it's gardening or maybe it's some like life skills or like whatever it is there's always like these required classes and you get to pick and choose but like mm -hmm. skateboarding whether or not you want to be a skateboarder at all in your life like yeah that should be a required class so, like in every kid should have to in, in as long as you're physically able right um but every kid should re like be required to learn how to pop an ollie totally because I, I feel like it's something that anybody can learn how to do and it brings you through the steps of like breaking down the process of something really teaching your brain and your muscles to like in your body to work in har harmony at the right timing mm -hmm. to perform this maneuver and it's something that anybody can do you know like anybody can learn how to do but like having that discipline to to do it like i think it would be like that should be like a required that should be a requirement is like every kid learning how to do an ollie i think every kid but every adult too should have should constantly have experiences of like uh achieving something that they once thought was impossible and i feel like an ollie is a good analogy to that it sounds like such like a like a surfer like hippie thing to say to like dude every kid <laughs> has to learn how to ollie but it's like so my true salt too. lamp and my and then the second thing that they should have to do is learn how to drop in on a quarter pipe yes because that is such a massive um display of committing to the plan yes the biggest thing about uh dropping in was not committing yeah I'm like you'd be sitting there at the top of the quarter pipe like i don't want to do this but i want to do it and i, I really want to drop in and like there's something weird about dropping in like that like you for the first time that's so scary but you know you can do it but then the, the time you get hurt the most is when you don't commit yeah you know and you you, yeah, you go in and you lean back and your board flies out or like yeah it's just, but it's like, especially like on a three foot quarter pipe or a four foot quarter pipe, if you just trust the, what you already know that is going to work, it you'll roll right out of that. I think That's that like analogy could be, that analogy could be applied towards like anything like painting is a good example. People always say, oh, like if I painted that, it would take me a year. So I think like, all right, we'll take a year and paint it then. What's the freaking problem? Like committing is such a major problem. Like learning an instrument, learning how to speak a language, learning how to drop in on a quarter pipe, like whatever your thing is, like most people, they try for a day or two or a week and they quit. And it's like, you were so close, you know, you were right there, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I think that's I'm, what sets a lot of people apart is just not quitting. This, yeah. this kills me, but I'm like looking at the time and I know you have a meeting, but I, I, I got to ask you a giant favor before you go. Okay. My kids are upstairs. I would love to have them come down here and say hi to you. Would you be okay? Oh, with of course, that? man. Are you sure? Yeah, hundred percent. Like, like my 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 twin sons, Grayson and Judah. Judah was a little more brave. Grayson was like terrified to talk to you, and my daughter Summer is uh was willing. And I think they're they're two neighbors. Their little skimboard crew is basically waiting, like foaming at the mouth to just say hi. Oh yeah, let's do it. Hey, here they are. Actually, come on down, guys. I'm gonna stick the uh, headphones in their ears because uh, I don't have a speaker. Who wants to say hi first? Oh, all right. What's right. up, guys? My neighbor Rami wants to say hi. Okay, come over here. Put in your ears. Come over here. What's your name? Right. Hey. 
Hold on. Can you hear him? All right. This is our neighbor, Remy. Hey, Remy. How's it going? Good. <laughs> Are you a skimboarder, too? Um, not really, but I um sometimes surf. That's cool. That's super cool. All you got right. Uncle Jay here okay. with you? Okay. All right. <laughs> Judah, you want to say hi? This is my son, Judah. Well, you put Judah, on, that's Judah. a cool name. Here, stick these in your ear. Is that in your ear? Hold that one, too. Can you hear okay? All right, this is Judah. Hi. What's up, Judah? How's it going, dude? Good. What do you like to do? Skimboard. Yeah, you're going to be a good skimboarder, I can tell. You got the build for it. He's got the drive in his eyes. <laughs> I want a trophy. Nice, dude. That's rad. Are you able to subscribe to our YouTube channel? For sure. Have 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 your dad send me the link. I'll I'll subscribe. Okay. All right. Ready to switch to Grace? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Come here, Summer. Come on. He has to get on the meetings. So you have to be quick. Put that in your ears. Got that in. I can't tell. Just don't hold it. Go ahead, hold it. All right, this is my daughter Summer. What's up, Summer? Uh, nothing. How's it going? Good. You skimboarding too, or surfing, or anything? Uh, yeah, I skimboard. Nice. You loving it? Yeah. What do you love about it? It's just very fun. Like, yeah. <laughs> you like feeling the slide? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Do you have any questions for him? No. You're afraid? Okay. <laughs> All right, Grayson. Come here, buddy. All right, you put these in your ears. Hold it in your ears so you can hear. Okay. All right, this is my son, Grayson. Well, he looks just like Judah. Headphones. Okay, you got that? He's definitely the twin, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. How's it going, dude? Good. You like skimboarding too? Yeah. Nice. Do you try to compete with your brother a lot? Who could be better? Um, sometimes. <laughs> That's funny. You have any questions for me? Uh, no. No. Anything at all? No. Well, that's easy. Keep it up, dude. Okay. Keep doing what you love and keep having fun with it. Good. Yeah. Okay. Is that everyone? Oh, Molly. All right. One more, and then we'll let you get to your meeting. Sorry. Okay, I'll get your neighbor Molly. Here, put that, put that in your ears. You got it. I'm gonna pick you up. Ready? One, two, three. Here we go. What's up, Molly? Nothing. Man, just a whole bunch. Of, are you surfing also? I surf and skim. Nice, man. You guys are killing it. I have one question for you. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. Will you be at Delaware this year? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I don't really, I haven't really been competing this year, so I might come. I might not. I don't know. Okay. But if I do, I'll definitely let, I'm going to definitely let Jay know and then we'll uh, maybe see you guys there. But if you, if you go have fun and go uh, crush it, do your best. Uh, <laughs> good. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Thank you guys. Thanks, Austin. No problem, man. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. That was a good way to uh, a fan audience there. A little tangled up here. I appreciate that, man. No worries. All right, bro. Well, you get your meeting, and dude, thank you so much. Yeah, man. I apologize. Time, man. I had to stop right at 10 here. No, it's all good, dude. Thanks for taking the time. It's uh, It's been nine years in the making, so I'm glad we got to finally have a nice conversation. Definitely, man. You do a really, you have like a really good job like analyzing people and, um, asking questions and stuff like that so you. really appreciate that it's like a really fun interview but like also helps kind of pull out you know like uh thought and emotion into it too so i think what you got going on is good thanks man well i think we both have equal parts like left left and right brain the create the creative and the logical are, are important and i think you have i think you obviously had the same thing so i appreciate you saying that thank you man yeah. All right, brother. I know we'll talk soon, but I get oh, you. Yeah, stay in touch, that. dude. And, uh, I love that you're getting the whole family involved with skimboarding. It's amazing. Yeah, skimming, surfing, skating, rock climbing. We try to do it all. That's epic. Best dad ever over here.
Hey, this is Judah Older. I hope you liked the episode. And we also have a YouTube channel. It's n- the name is Judah and Grayson Alders. Grayson and Judah Alders. How do you spell it? G R E Y S O N. The and symbol. J U D A H. And then A L D E R S. What else? They should subscribe to you. Yeah, can you subscribe? Thank you. I really hope that you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please take a moment, leave me a review on Spotify and Apple especially. It takes about only 30 to 40 seconds to leave a nice review. You can just click on the stars. You can say something nice. I really do read them all, and it really does mean a lot to me. If you could just please do that, and also make sure you hit subscribe and uh, share the episode, connect with me online, connect with our guests. You know, we love all the interaction, so please do so. Also, please check out my website, jalders.com. I am an artist. I'm a father. I'm a family man. I appreciate your support. I would love to get your eyeballs on my artwork. So, um, yes, keep sending messages. Let me know who you'd like to see on the show next, and I wish you an awesome rest of your day.